first and foremost, let's not be jerks for Jesus. Come on. Let's not be combative uh, and suppress our ability to be compassionate. And Jesus said, we will give an account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. That means those things in our cultural war desire to be real. Like we're going to give an account for those things because we don't want to allow those things to be a stumbling block for people that maybe we're just not being clear. Let's be clear. Let's get to the heart of it. As you know, on this show, Can I Trust the Bible? We don't do fluff. We get right to the heart of the matter. Controversies comfortableness and all. And today we're going for the jugular. We are addressing some of the most politically incorrect stances of the Bible. I'm talking about everything from sin to hell to physical intimacy from a biblical perspective, just just all the things. What does the Bible say? And how should we as Christians navigate these uh, cultural landmines? And we're going to do all of this without getting flagged by YouTube. I promise, Mr. YouTube Google man, we're going to be good. So this should be fun. Well, if you spend any time on YouTube researching these topics, you'll see one dude who just keeps popping up. My guy, my man, Ruslan is here with us again to help us get after it. Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload. And give us a thumbs up because that tells YouTube to share this video with more people. My man, how we doing? Hey, man. Thanks for having me back. You ready for this? I'm ready. Sin. Bro, let's yeah. talk about it. Let's talk about it. So I think the best way to start is in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, because I think one of the things that I see is that even the idea of sin has become very politically incorrect. What do you mean I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. What do you mean what I'm doing isn't what God would have me? You can't tell me what to do. And I think a lot of people have made Christianity out to be, you are bad and now you're good. But I think what's beautiful about scripture, which makes me almost weep, is it's not that you were bad and now you're good. It's that you were dead. Mm -hmm. Now you're alive. Now you're alive. So Ephesians 2 reads as, as follows. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, mm. gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, here it is, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Mm. That's not politically correct. But because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. When I think about Jesus, not as some holy man, which he is, not as some great teacher, which he is, but as my Savior, I was dead. And yet he stooped down to this humiliating point and said, you, I'm going to do this for you. And he's on the cross and he's being spit at, and he's literally the worst physical torture. I'm doing this not to say that sin doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Quite contrary, because it does, and I love you so much. So I, I, there's a few things that can get me emotional really fast, and mm -hmm. that's one of them. Why do you think something as basic as sin has become so politically incorrect? I think most of us default to one of two positions, and I believe Martin Luther said this. We either default to rebellion against God, or to a religious worship where all we do is try to find our own righteousness in our deeds. And so people either want to say, it doesn't all matter. What does it mean? I'm going to rebel. I am my own God. This is my truth. Or they think that their lifestyle and their morality and their rule keeping makes them a better person and ultimately what earns their way into heaven. And the truth is both are false. The truth is but, and both are prideful, and both are sinful, and both are wrong. And I think we want that. Our heart naturally defaults to that. There's always the rebel, and there's always the self-righteous person, 
right? If you think about high school and you think about <laughs> the kids you grew up with, there was always that, right? There's always the guy that just doesn't care. He's the class clown. And there's always the person that's like, I'm going to do all the homework. And I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to be a good person because that's what makes me a good, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, the truth is that we're broken. We're broken people. And so what's beautiful about what you just described is if we look at the, the, the Bible as a whole, we see Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, God creates man in his image. So we're created as these image bearers to reflect the goodness of God, right? And we have dominion over the earth and we have good work that we're supposed to do. And then sin breaks all of that and we rebel and we break all of that and we blame shift. The man blames the woman, the woman blames the snake. No one wants to take responsibility for anything. And, and then Jesus comes. So it's like good news, awful news, good news. And then Jesus comes, lives the life we couldn't live, dies the death we should have died on the cross. And so I think we just, we wrestle with this because I think intrinsically we know that at, at the end of the day, when the lights are out, when it's just you, when there's no one else around, and you compare yourself to the standards that God has, you know you're a pretty crummy person that needs grace and needs mercy. But it's hard to humble yourself and, and ask for that and acknowledge that. Mm. You and I had a another conversation about deconstructing of faith, and I think one of the things I... I typically here is that sin just, it it means that, okay, a lot of people nowadays are creating their identity however so they please. Mm -hmm. And if you're telling me my God disapproves of my identity, mm -hmm. how do you even have that conversation? Well, I think you have to get back to what were you created for. And if there is a creator, then the creator gets to dictate what something is created for. And so most people don't like that. But I was having a conversation with two of my atheist, one atheist, one agnostic comedian friends, and we were having this conversation. I say, hey, when you get to write a joke, you get to decide if you scrap that joke. You get to decide if you do that joke. You get to decide if you redeem the joke and keep working the joke. You decide what the intent of the joke is. And in the same way, God decides what he does with his creation. You don't get to dictate and tell God and demand God what he is and isn't willing to do. He is the creator. You are the creation. There is a distinction. You are not God. You are not divine. And I think most people uh, know this on an intrinsic level, but they don't want to acknowledge it because if you acknowledge it, then you got to be accountable to Go it. On. And no, we don't like accountability. Okay, so we're going to take this a step more awkward. Hell, mm -hmm. man, if you would talk to young people, the thing that, that just breaks the uh, the desire to want to be a Christian is like, okay, but you're telling me that a loving God mm -hmm. is going to send people to hell, to which I'm like, yeah, let me, let me unpack that. And so what you see is a lot of people, a lot of movements, again, going back to this deconstructing idea, where it's the idea that did God really mean eternal damnation? Does weeping and gnashing of teeth mean for like a hot minute? or a siesta in hell. You're going to tell me that a guy is going to spend eternity there? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really hard conversation to have because it sounds so much harsher than, hey, God's not pleased with you hooking up with your girlfriend. All right, fine, I whatever, I get it. But you're going to tell me that if I keep living this lifestyle and reject God, that there's a place for me called <laughs> hell? And I feel like a lot of people have kind of made it well known that there is a large swath of this, again, call it progressive Christianity, that almost like, it's too uncomfortable, it's too politically incorrect to talk about hell. So you obviously talk about it. What do you say? I think the idea of hell can be challenging, and people can, can struggle with it. But sometimes we're asking the wrong question. You said people who are rejecting God. My question would be, why would anybody rejecting God want to be with God in eternity? Mm. So I think God is just giving people over to what they want. You want to be your own God. Wow. So I'm going to give you over. That's what Romans 1 says. God's giving them over to their own depraved, disgusted, perverted version. So people are mad at hell, but they're mad at a God who would create hell, but they think hell is unjust, but they don't want to go to heaven and spend eternity with heaven and God with God anyway. So what what are we even arguing about. You don't want to be in heaven. You don't You don't want to be in the presence of God. You don't desire God. You are hell-bent on being your own God. And so you are choosing to put yourself in hell. You are rejecting God. You are continuing to be embraced with the beauty and the goodness of what the cross symbolizes and says, ah, it's not good enough. Mm. 
right? And I think when you look at it that way, it, it, it starts to change things. And I'll go back to the conversation I was having with my two atheist comedian friends. And I said, hey, as a comedian, if something you've created is not aligning with what you designed it for, and you put together a joke or whatever, and it's not doing what you need it to do, don't you have the right to discard it? Don't you have the right to, right? So again, if God is the creator of all, he ultimately has the say on what does and doesn't fly. Mm. And so people will be mad and judge God, ignoring the irony that you are worthy of judgment. <laughs> like you are the one that's judging God over something that you don't even really want. You don't really want to have it. Yeah. It's more of a philosophical, let's kind of have an interesting conversation about yeah. the idea of hell, but there's consequences. There have to be consequences, right? So you talked about what does and doesn't fly with God. So we're going to go even one level deeper, closer to YouTube getting mad at us land, which they're not going to be. They're going to be so cool with this video. <laughs> I mean, you you deal with it. You almost have 400,000 YouTube subscribers. You got the... I see you skirting we the... Have, we definitely have coded language <laughs> yeah. that we use. So we're going to use the term physical intimacy. All right. So this is one thing that obviously I think is a landmine field throughout the biggest landmine field when it comes to biblical Christianity. So you're telling me that the only way that we can have said physical intimacy is a man and woman in the covenant of marriage. That seems, using language, uh, oppressive. That seems uh, backwards. That seems judgmental. That's all the adjectives. Mm -hmm. What's your response? Well, one, I think we have to stop and acknowledge that it's not about good people who go to heaven. It's forgiven people that go to heaven. And so there are all types of things that people may wrestle with in their life and struggle and potentially limp their way into heaven. So I want to say that. And the intimacy thing is interesting is when you look up when Paul is writing about this thing or Jesus is talking about sexual immorality that word in the Greek for sexual immorality is pornonia it's where we get our word porn from and it's more or less a junk drawer term for all sexual perversion outside of a one man one woman covenantal marriage and that is clearly by design there on purpose. So what we want to do is we want to just say, oh, it's just the LGTV people. No, no, it's yeah. the dude yep. manipulating yep. his girlfriend. Huge point. Like it's it's all of it. It's all encompassing. Yeah. And what was your body intended for? Yep. And we just can look at the basic physical anatomy of what does a man have? What does a woman have? What happens in the potential to recreate and to produce life? It's not rocket science. And this is, again, we're Romans, we go back to Romans 1, we're suppressing stuff that's common sense. Mm-hmm. And everything is out. Everything besides a one man, one woman marriage mm-hmm. in covenant, it's out. And that is not as controversial when you literally think through it as people think. Mm-hmm. When you think about if the entire world just did that, mm-hmm. That would completely alleviate Mm -hmm. a lot of our social ills. Mm. That would alleviate a lot of broken families. That would alleviate a lot of adultery, all of the adultery. That would alleviate unwanted pregnancies. That would alleviate Mm. most of our issues, really, if you really think about it. And when you're talking about ethics and morality and right and wrong, if the whole world just did that, we're going to save this intimate act for marriage between one man and woman. That would alleviate a lot of different Mm -hmm. things. And so it's in our best interest. It's in our benefit. Not to mention that the data backs this up that the people who are the most fulfilled in their intimacy life are, shocker, evangelical Christians who were virgins or had lower body counts, meaning they didn't have a ton of partners, find the most levels of fulfillment with their intimacy in marriage. Who would have thought that the way God intended it is actually the people that are experiencing the most happiness, the least likely to get divorced, the more likely to pair bond, all of these different things. And the people struggling the most are the people that have went out and have had dozens and dozens and dozens of partners and and been promiscuous. I'm not saying there's not redemption for that. I'm not saying God can't heal. But that is one of those things where you look at the, the how, where does this path go and where does this path go? And statistically speaking, you're way more likely to be fulfilled by doing it God's way. You're way more likely to earn a higher income by doing it God's way. It's crazy. And they're just now finding out about this. And this is the non-Christians are acknowledging this. Other pockets are starting to say, well, you know, those Christians, I think they got it right on this. The way you navigated that answer was brilliant. That deserves a round of applause <laughs> for how you did that. But I think, I think that's a, a very uh, important uh, distinction, is that people have this 
um, obsession with saying, oh, well, you're anti-LGBTQIA, where it's like, no, no, no. If my my homie comes to me and says, hey, is it cool that I sleep with my girlfriend? I'm like, listen, like, I'm just as guilty as you were back in my day, right. but no, lovingly, I'm, I'm going to say no. It's all the same boat. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I this might be TMI and my wife, hi, if you're watching, I would say a lot of the stuff that we used to participate in, we're still undoing a lot of the damage. Mm-hmm. We've been married almost 10 years mm-hmm. that we used to live when we used to live the ways of the world. And it's physical intimacy outside of um, marriage for us and for anyone is a pretty self selfish act. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you're doing it for yourself. You're you're trying to get something out of it. And then to flip it in marriage and think, okay, this is a selfless act. Mm-hmm. This is this is for the other person. It's it just it's the exact opposite mm-hmm. of what the world tells you to do. The world says, hey, uh, when your relationship gets tough, bounce. Mm-hmm. Marriage says when your relationship gets tough, you know, get tougher. You make it, make it. And so it's like it's literally we've trained our bodies and the whole idea of spiritual ties when you're when you sleep with other people, all that stuff is real. And so the idea that it's just, oh, well, you guys are anti this. It's like, no, no, no. I, I think that's such an important distinction. It's like, listen, we love you enough across the spectrum of what it means to say what God's truth is because we love you. Mm-hmm. I think Tim Keller said, of all the virtues, this is huge, of all the virtues, love forgives the most but condones the least. Mm, that's good. My son's only four, but that kid is four going on 20. He's a flirt. And by the time he gets to be in high school, I'm going to be like, listen, it's not because I want to restrict you out of anger or out of being just a bad dad or quite the contrary. I'm going to say, hey, this isn't what's best for you. And scripture talks about, so it'll go well with you. I want what's best for you. I love you so much. I would jump in front of a train for you, Mm -hmm. my son. Let me show you the way that God designed it. Mm -hmm. I think that gets lost so much where it's like, oh, you're just anti this. Mm -hmm. So when people are, you know, maybe on a college campus watching this video and they are, they give these one line tropes, these Twitter, these tweets, it's X now, these, these one liners, Mm -hmm. oh, you're, you're just hateful, you're a bigot. Mm -hmm. How do you even switch that conversation around to be like, no, 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 everything I'm saying is coming from love. We first have to be specific. What what is hateful about what's being described? What is bigoted about what's being described? Let's get very very specific and unpack those things. And so that's what I would I would actually just ask for clarity. Like, what do you mean when you say that? And I think when people start to logically think through these things, then they most people will concede that yeah, it, I don't like it, but it does make sense. What you what do you want for your kids? Yeah, I would prefer my kids to wait until they get married. All right, then. That's what God prefers for you. Case closed. We're done. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, because because most people don't acknowledge the obvious. Of like, how do you want your kids? You want your kids out here looking at weird stuff at 13? You want them sleeping around? You you want all the... You don't want those things for your mm-hmm. kids. Nobody wants those things for, the, for for their kids or their nieces or their nephews. And so people would say, well, that's idealistic. It's like, well, no, that's just having a standard. There's having a standard Come for on. yourself, right? So if I am pro having a physical standard for myself. And I say, in order to have a physical standard for myself, I need to eat chicken, steak, and broccoli. And I love chicken, steak, and broccoli. There is a time and a place where I might have a piece of cake, but it's within the context of what is ultimately the goal and what is ultimately the standard. So it's not that I think everyone ever, at any time who's ever had cake is a bad person and is evil and is lazy and is... No, 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 no. The standard is this. The standard is in my best interest. And the standard requires a certain degree of sacrifice to get a, cer- a specific result. And I think if most people were honest, then we would acknowledge that. But instead, we do silly things like food neutrality. And you know, I don't want to get too derailed, but people just start changing the definitions of things because they, they know there's an objective standard, an objective reality. Well, there's the transition for our last big dive down to the deep parts of YouTube uh, being careful with what we say. And that is, what do we do? with something that maybe 10 years ago was, for, I mean, even people who, who, that believe in this stuff w- would say it was somewhat of a fringe ideology, but now it's become right in your face. How do we as, as Bible-believing Christians, as people that 
believe that Yeshua of Nazareth rose from the grave, that he saved us, and it's by faith that we are redeemed and all this beautiful stuff. How do we deal with this gender ideology stuff? How do we deal with, um, again, I don't even know what's allowed to be said, but the, the trans stuff, like what, what, how do we navigate that? I think we first have to navigate it from a place of grace and truth. I think there's a a time to extend grace and a time to stand on truth. And usually those two things are perceived to be incompatible, but they're not. John talks about, John chapter 1 talks about Jesus coming full of grace and truth. So I think we have to have a degree of grace and truth in all those conversations and be careful and gentle with how we talk about these things and make a distinguishable point that there's a difference between the ideology that is being pushed by the radicals and the individual that is dealing with gender dysphoria. That not every person that's a part of that community believes in all the ideology, not every person a part of the LGBTQIA community believes in this stuff. And so I think one is just like making a distinction and then addressing the ideologies and not addressing or attacking the people. Yeah. So how do, <laughs> how do we address the ideology? Well, I think we have to go back to like what is objective about reality and obje objective about biology and objective about the way God made us and the way God designed our bodies. And that your thoughts aren't always things. That just because you feel something on a neurochemical level, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's something different about your brain or different about your anatomy. That you can feel all kinds of interesting things or think all kinds of interesting things on a neurochemical level, but those things don't need to be manifested in a physical sense. And the rest of society doesn't have to acknowledge you as said thing, right? And I think that is hard because we're in a culture and a society where emotions and what you feel about yourself is the, the highest virtue. You're being your true authentic self. There's parts of my true authentic self that need to be suppressed and put to death. Come on. Right? Romans 8 talks about putting our sin to death, waging war on our sin. And if we're just about our true authentic self, man, there's a lot of us that are going to get in trouble if that's, that becomes the highest mm -hmm. virtue is let me just do what's instinctual and true to me because everything that's instinctual and true to you is not always healthy and good mm -hmm. for your brother and it's definitely not always honoring to God. Mm -hmm. And so I would say your thoughts don't dictate the rest of society. And just because you feel things, your feelings aren't always real. They, they're not always a distinction. They could be messengers telling you something else is wrong, but they're not always indicative of what's happening with your brain. I think that's one of the interesting things that a lot of songs are, are pushing these days, which is if you think about it, it sounds great. You know, you're perfect just the way you are. Don't change who you are. I'm like, that sucks for someone to be told that. Like, I want to grow. Mm -hmm. I want to mature. I want to get better. I want to see my failings. And to tell someone, don't, mm -hmm. don't change. Yep. That that's almost seems unloving to me. So with you, with you know, hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers, you see the comments. What's one more thing that's you know a little dicey, a little spicy that you find that people are really concerned about what uh, you know uh, something that people really are looking for clarity about that come to your channel i think right now one of the things that people are wrestling with the most is inflation is going up cost of housing is going up there's a degree of uncertainty with the economy and the government all these different things and there becomes these downstream views of all of this that we don't know where they come from and whether it's your truth or whether it's post-modernity and people say these the patriarchy people are saying these buzzwords yeah. without really understanding the origins and who are saying these things so right now there's this idea of being cisgendered and all these things if you go up the the, the, the downstream of that and you see or the upstream of that rather you see that these french philosophers who coined these things are the same french philosophers who were okay with, with pedophilia and were okay with this really weird stuff and you go further upstream and you start seeing marxism and all these other things right and, th and, and this is not like conspiracy theory stuff and so i think there's a lot of people that are unfortunately navigating through this neo-marxist postmodern paradigm and they don't even know what they're rebelling against but mm -hmm. they, but th things are hard and instead of taking self-inventory and saying how can i chisel myself into the person that god wants me to be mm -hmm. how can i 
take ownership? How could I become more of an asset to my employer? How can I become more of an asset to my family? How can I become the person that God's created? It's easier just to deflect and blame mm. the society and the system and everything is rigged and all these different things. And that doesn't serve you well. Like that ideology is harmful to you because again, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's really interesting what you said about going upstream of these, of these thoughts. So I'm going to try to say this without actually saying it, um, which is... To me, one of the more eye-opening things, when you look at, for example, the history of Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. and you look at Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. and you look at her thoughts on eugenics. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I don't know where the line is. I'm probably not going to say much about it. But I'm just going to say maybe Google what Margaret Sanger yep. said about eugenics. And then when you have discussions right. about the sanctity of life, then you can come at, oh, I... I might disagree with you, but but let's go upstream to see where your ideology comes from. Yep, yeah, and you're totally spot on. Think about the idea of someone announcing a pregnancy, and we all go, yay, congratulations, you're having a baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You don't say you're having a fetus, you're having a clump of cells. We all know what that is. Yeah. We know exactly what that is. But... That postmodernity, that postmodern paradigm, that deconstructionist paradigm, all of those things that make things subjective to what you're feeling and what you think about something, that is what you think and feel about it. Well, if that's the paradigm you're looking at the world through, me and you would say, no, that's a baby in there. But they say, no, 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 my truth is that it's, it's just a clump of cells. It's, it's little. It's a clump of cells. We can't see it. It's not a baby yet, mm -hmm. right? And so that is then how you go to these, these uh, like, wild conclusions that it's okay to do that. And the science says that's human DNA, mm -hmm. right? There's all kinds of 10 fingers, 10 toes, heartbeat, brain, wave, all these things are happening, but yet people may, and, and what is, again, what's the upstream effects? It is this, my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. I get to decide if it's a baby or not. And whatever, if it benefits me, then it's a baby. If it, if I think it causes me economic harm, then it's not a baby. I always had a a political stance on the subject that we're talking about until my wife got pregnant and I saw the 12 week ultrasound. Then it, it didn't become, mm -hmm. it wasn't political. It was theological. It was like mm -hmm. that. I like wept. I was like, that mm -hmm. is a human being. Mm -hmm. That is a human being. Mm -hmm. Let's say someone's watching this. This is, I think a good way to close out. And they're, let's say they are a believer, mm -hmm. but man, Cancel culture, mm -hmm. man, losing friends, man, getting ostracized, man, getting flunked, man, losing my job. Yeah. How do we, I mean, you do it brilliantly. And again, if, if you aren't already, make sure you subscribe to Ruslan's YouTube channel. He's, he's brilliant. He, he, I couldn't recommend a YouTube channel more than his uh, to address some of these things. But let's say my friend here is watching and they're just like, bro, like, I don't know how to even attempt to talk about these things, but I don't want to remain silent, but I don't want to just shut my mouth, mm -hmm. but I don't want to remain apathetic. What would you say to them? Well, I would say first and foremost, let's not be jerks for Jesus. Come on. Let's not be combative uh, and suppress our ability to be compassionate. Let's not be unnecessarily hostile to people that hold different positions. Because some, some of us have held wrong beliefs and wrong views and wrong ideologies and have said things that we didn't know the upstream effects and where they came from. And so I would say, let's not do that because that's not helpful. And then second, I would say, if you have friends, families, employers, whoever, try and move towards clarity. Try and move to exactly what you believe and why you disagree on said thing. I, I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine, close one of my closest friends, and he sat me down in January and he said, man, I just feel like you've gone too fringe right on me. And I said, fringe right? Like, do you know what fringe right is? Like, like you don't know what fringe right is. Like, I, I'm despised by the actual fringe right. Like, th that world does not like me. And he said, well, I just feel like you're really on this, like, you know, uh, deletion of babies is wrong. And you just kind of really went hard when Roe v. Wade got overturned. I was like, yeah, because people were acting like the sky was falling. So we had this conversation. He was very, like, guarded. And, and, and I had never really experienced, like, relational fallout because of, to me, what is stating the obvious. So we had the conversation. And then... A few months later, I called him. I said, let's have another conversation about this. And the more clarity 
we created, the more things we, cre- we, we got to the heart of the issue, the more he said, okay, I, I understand I misjudged a clip. I misinterpreted what you said. I understand your heart now, and I get what you're saying. So I think a lot of people, and, and, and he might say, I still disagree, but I understand your heart. Mm. And that's where we want to move towards is let's get clarity and communicate our heart be- before we throw out a relationship over something that is ideological. Let's get to the heart of it because we want to maintain these spaces, because we want to maintain our influence over our non-Christian family members, over our non-Christian friends, or maybe even our Christian friends who are struggling with some of these ideologies. We want to maintain it. So we don't want to blow our witness or blow our influence because we are afraid to lean into hard conversations or because we lack the humility to seek clarity in something that maybe we're murky about. Maybe we didn't clearly communicate. And as I leaned into those conversations over and over, and I, and I kept telling him, I'm here fighting for our friendship. And he said, oh, man, I really appreciate you. And it, it, after another three or four hour conversation, it ended up being reconcil- reconciliation was able to happen, and it was beautiful. And we still don't agree on anything, but we don't have to. And I think most most sensible people and most reasonable people don't need to agree with us on everything. I think most people are, le- are seeking are you really concerned about what's best for people? Are you really concerned for these babies or do you just want to control women's bodies, right? That's a, that's a very like a polar, like let me just give you what, it, or is it about the patriarchy, right? Like, no, 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 let's get to the heart and, and when they understand, no, we're, we actually want what's best for people yeah. and when I actually want what's best for you, they may say, I disagree with you, but I'm not going to throw out the friendship. Wow. And the people that are going to throw away the friendship you probably don't want to be with friends with them anyway, right? The people that are going to say, I'm completely discarding you, that company that wants to fire you over this, stuff, you probably don't want to work there anyway. But I say all that to say, it's just all anchored on the premise of let's not be unnecessarily combative. Let's not be jerks for Jesus and then call it persecution. Wow. That's not persecution. You were just being <laughs> a nuisance. You were being a derelict on the internet. Be careful. And Jesus said, we will give an account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. That means those things in our cultural war desire to be react, like we're gonna give an account for those things because we don't wanna allow those things to be a stumbling block for people that maybe we're just not being clear. Let's be clear, let's get to the heart of it. Wow, my brother, thank you for your clarity. Thank you for your wisdom. Uh, this has been educational to me. I know it's been very encouraging to everyone watching. So Ruslan, thanks, man. Thank you, brother, appreciate you.